Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for another fantastic PAN presentation, Virtual Workplace, which as anyone can see, I'm actually in the office today, which feels really good. It's been a while, um, but we are still in this hybrid area of life right now. So until we get back to whatever normal means, uh, you're gonna hear from an incredible moderator and panel today about furthering and fostering relationships virtually. And all I wanted to do is come and give you a, an update about our 100th anniversary. Um, I think I've spoken to everyone and given an update every time we've had this presentation. So what I'd like to share with everyone today are just a couple of key points. Of course, we are in our 100th year, which is very exciting, but it's quite a different year. And we need everyone's support now more than ever. We saw the request for our services increase 140% last year which is quite a staggering statistic. And you know, thankfully, many people stepped up to make that possible. And we hope that that continues. And it also gives us um, the exact reason why we need to raise so much money in honor of our 100th anniversary. Um, because if there's anything unsexier, it's that unrestricted fund. But I think we all now know why it's so important and why it's the backbone of any organization. And, and we would like to exist for another 100 years. So far beyond us in the room. Um, we are coming up upon, as many people know, the Oscars have been delayed until April. Uh, one of our big fundraisers of the year, the night before, named appropriately for the night before the Oscars, is happening on April 24th. It will be virtual. We're hoping it's one of the last virtual events we do for the year. So everyone, fingers crossed for that. Um, we're happy to provide any kind of sponsorship deck. If anyone knows a company that would like to be involved in this incredible event, we have a VIP hour hosted uh, by Billy Harris, who's absolutely fantastic. He did our evening before uh, food by renowned chef Antonia Lafaso of Scopa and many other restaurants. Um, we have special musical presentations. We are working on the rest of the show right now, but it's, it's going to be an incredible night. So if anything you can do to support, join, uh, please do not hesitate to reach out. I'll make sure, and I know Jonathan's gonna tell you later, but please be active in the chat. We wanna, we wanna respond in real time. We wanna provide you with that information. So um, let's hear from everybody today. Also, if you haven't gone on our website, we have a document that is hopefully will be a great resource for everyone. And as our advocates, which we, we just can't thank you enough for your support and being involved with us. We hope you get a lot from being a part of PAN because we get a lot from you being a part of it with us. And on our website in the hundredth section, we have our one sheets. Uh, there's 17 of them. They lay out all of our services, all of our um, everything that we do and has some information about our hundredth, as well as a sheet of all of the important phone numbers that you might need. The table of contents is clickable, so you can go right to it. It's very easy. You can download the PDF um, on the website. We also have officially partnered with Christie's, uh, the world-renowned auction house. So we will be doing an auction for the century at the end of the year. Uh, we're working on securing really incredible items that are either part of iconic Hollywood history. Um, of course, other genres, the sports world are, that's obviously welcome too, because this is going to Christie's global audience, but this is really special and we're trying to keep it as close to Hollywood as possible because that's who we are and that's what we're about. And uh, Christie's was thrilled to have just the potential of what we're going to bring. So if anyone would like to play a part in helping with that, uh, we welcome it. Um, we are also planning our 100th gala. Again, fingers crossed it will be in person at the end of the year. So we'll give you more details about that. And my last announcement before I introduce you to one of our incredible co-chairs is that we have a Heartbeat of Hollywood golf tournament that we do every year. Last year, the event did not happen, of course. This year we have confirmed on June 7th, it will take place in person. So um, for those familiar with the event, there's usually a, a part of it called Heartbeat Light at Castle Park, the miniature golf course that is not happening this year. And we usually have a big party on campus 
unfortunately that's also not happening but baby steps and we're getting back into at least playing golf which i'm sure many of you have um been on the course i know i got to finally play recently which was wonderful so without further ado i'd like to introduce you to our incredible co-chair sharam hazani and get the event started thank you so much Thank you, Courtney. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sharam Hazani, MPTF's Professional Advisory Network Co-Chair. I'm glad you're able to join us today for PAN's second quarter presentation. I would like to thank all of our PAN members who renewed their membership for 2021. We appreciate your support and hope that we'll be meeting in person in the summer. Uh, only time will tell if that will actually happen. Uh, fingers are crossed. When the stay at home orders were mandated almost a year ago now, I thought, okay, this is bad, but it'll last about a month or two and everything will be back to normal. Well, it didn't quite turn out that way. Uh, within a month, we realized we were in this for the long haul. I began to experience many emotions, fear, frustration, relief, anxiety, depression, optimism, and pessimism and sometimes all in the same day. I lost a lot of sleep and didn't have all the answers for my children when the pandemic started. My inquisitive four-year-old Zoe asked a lot of questions about why she had to stay indoors, why she couldn't go to school, why she couldn't see her friends, or why she couldn't play with me when I was at home working. On the professional side, I wondered how business was going to operate successfully. How was I going to meet with my clients and add the personal touch that's so important when you're face to face with someone? How was I going to communicate with my team and staff to tackle the tasks at hand to help our clients, especially when they had so much anxiety themselves? Well, obviously we found a way, as you can see by this Zoom presentation. Now we're starting to see the light and the darkness of the pandemic is starting to trail. But as we've experienced, things can change very quickly and we can be back to square one again. But I'm feeling very optimistic today. And when the new normal is determined and there are no more restrictions as we know it, there will probably be some business operations and processes, habits and activities that we will carry over from working from home full time. For me personally, working from home has made me more efficient. While I was already incorporating a lot of the latest technology in my practice, I was forced to use it even more, and now I see the benefits. Whether it's communicating with my team, my staff, or my clients, using technology while developing and maintaining a personal connection has become more crucial. Our presentation today will cover this exact topic, to talk more about the virtual reality of business relationships, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Jonathan Fitzgerald. Jonathan is the managing partner at Equinox Strategy Partners and provides service professionals and firms with strategic counsel to drive revenue and increase market visibility. He has also become a very valuable member of the MPTF PAN Advisory Board, and it's been great having his ideas and his energy on the board to help bring great topics to our members. Please help me welcome Jonathan Fitzgerald. Thank you, Sharam. I appreciate the introduction. At the age of 20, Mike Tyson was the youngest heavyweight champion in history. And when you talk to sports fans about what made that the case, they will tell you that his age was a determining factor. His thirst for winning was a huge determining factor. And also his willingness to take risk all led to a very early success. 10 years later, Mike experienced the highlight of his career uh, as, the, as the World Boxing Association's heavyweight title. Now, for most of you that are unfamiliar with boxing, most professionals, most fighters will fight between one or two matches a year. And in between that time, they'll take three or four months off from training and conditioning. In Tyson's first defense 
of the WBA title, he was pitted against the second best boxer in the world, which was Evang uh, Evander Holyfield. And having dealt with a number of personal issues um, and recently coming out of retirement, Tyson only spent four weeks training for this upcoming fight with Holyfield. He didn't really take it that seriously. Um, and part of the issues were he spent some time in prison. His mother happened to pass during that time. He had some real issues. Uh, despite all of that, Tyson was expected to destroy Holyfield by the odds of 50 to 1. Now, on the other hand, having recently come out of retirement, Holyfield as the underdog prepared both mentally and physically to an extreme uh, extent. He constantly trained to the point where he even studied Tyson's former matches so that he could understand Tyson's strength and his quickness. Although Tyson started strong in the match that resulted, Holyfield met every single punch for punch that Tyson threw his way. And ultimately, Holyfield defeated Tyson in the 11th round. When asked about what it was about Holyfield that allowed him to defeat Tyson, most fight commentators referred to Holyfield's preparedness and as a competitive advantage and that Holyfield was always in fighting condition. Our discussion centers today around your readiness as professionals, as advisors, to always be in fighting condition. And regardless of what your role is with your company, what your role is with your clients, there are certain foundational elements of always being ready, and we want to talk about those today. In terms of COVID, it seems like most professionals or most organizations have taken one of two routes. Some of them have put their head in the sand, hoping for the weather to pass sooner rather than later. The other half have said, now is our opportunity to really gain a competitive advantage. We're going to double down on everything that we're doing from a client service and a client development perspective. Our panel today consists of professionals who have decided to take the latter of the two approaches and to always be in fighting condition. And let's go ahead at this point and start with some very brief introductions. Scott, will you start us out? Give us your name, title, role at the firm, and um, a little bit about your practice. Sure. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you for having me. I'm Scott Ron. I am the managing partner of RMO LLP. We are a litigation law firm based here in Century City, and we specialize in trust, estate, probate, and conservatorship litigation, fighting for the legacies that our clients' families fought so hard to build. Thanks, Scott. Elsa, will you go next? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Elsa Ramo. Uh, managing partner of Ramo Law. My firm specializes in transactional entertainment work, basically all forms of content from television to feature film. And uh, I established my firm over 15 years ago. So I've been through uh, an economic crisis in 2008 and a pandemic and also the disillusion of 35 millimeter film. So nice to see everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Elsa. Uh, David, please. Hi, my name is David Holtz. I'm a very special tax attorney. I was uh, born a CPA, uh, be, uh, got my JD and became a lawyer and then worked for Darth Vader, the IRS for five years. Uh, we, I left and joined, uh, uh, made a firm with my buddies at the IRS um, uh, where we just do tax controversy work, defending people on collection matters or uh, audit matters or criminal matters. And the firm now has been together about 16 years, and there's seven attorneys. We're all exclusively former Internal Revenue Service attorneys. Thanks, David. And as Sharam mentioned, I'm Jonathan Fitzgerald, ma managing partner of Equinox Strategy Partners. We work with lawyers and accountants and business managers on increasing their revenue and their visibility in the marketplace. During our presentation today, folks, please, if you have questions, we'd like to take them in real time. Go ahead and throw them into the chat and I'll monitor them as the discussion proceeds and we'll get to as many of your questions as time permits. We've organized our discussion today into some different sections. The first section that we'd like to address is how do we as professionals 
make new relationships when we can't do things that we're normally used to doing. In the past, prior to COVID, whenever we wanted to develop a new relationship, we'd invite someone to lunch, we'd invite them to happy hour, we would try to do something that was in person that would allow us to interact. Now that we're not running into people at conferences or networking events or on our way to or from lunch, uh, it really begs the question, how do we continue to build our network if we can't be in person? And so Elsa, perhaps you can address that first for the panel. How during the past year have you been able to expand your network with new relationships, even though you can't necessarily be face to face with people? I think there's a couple of things. One is rather than thinking about new and fresh, it's about enhancing relationships. So that's something that's been a big um, focus for us as a firm is spending that extra time or making the time to talk to a business manager or a talent agent that we've been dealing with for years, but have the luxury of maybe setting aside a few extra minutes to commiserate or identify what they're dealing with. Um, the other aspect of it is really enhancing our referrals to one another. So it's about making strategic introductions for other people. And that has opened up doors for us to get to know um, and ask for references or referrals in areas that, you know, we didn't really necessarily have the time to try to find a labor attorney that other people really liked and reach out to and, and kind of be strategic about networking and reaching out to new people um, in areas that we can be a little bit more targeted. I'd say like the sniper network approach, like does anyone know of a, of a really, gate, really great trust litigation attorney and like Scott would pop up on that list. And, you know, so I've been trying to be a little bit strategic about who I'm trying to meet and, and using my existing network to find those people. And so to be strategic in doing that, do those introductions just come to you in the middle of the night and all of a sudden you think, hey, I've got someone that I need to introduce David or Scott to? Are you collaborating with your team on coming up with names? Is it something you're proactively doing or on an ad needed basis as different, as different situations arise? For us, um, we've tried to take a little bit more of a strategic approach because you know we're a company of 14 attorneys and supporting staff. So we try to have a collective consciousness about who we know. And so we have a reference sheet that we use of cross referrals of, um, you know, insurance brokers or business managers or people that we've worked with and like and, and what sort of their areas of expertise are. So we try to share that information um, to help associates and, and, and attorneys that may not know them have a, a reference point of how to know them. And we also take very sort of methodical notes about who we meet and why so that there's a, a cohesiveness or a collective consciousness about the people that we meet and we're trading that information within the organization. So those of you listening from home, I think this is a big takeaway that you can implement into your practice or into your business right away is, do you have kind of an approved vendor list of sorts? Are there specific professionals out there that you're looking to help build their businesses as well? You can be super intentional about it so that more of your people are funneling opportunities to prefer perhaps fewer but more intentional professionals out there that you're trying to either initiate or continue a relationship with. Scott, how about for you? Have, how have you gone about continuing to build your network when you can't be face-to-face -face with people? Sure. Well, I think for, for many of us, it starts with the why. And our why at RMO is about helping people. So whether that means we as a law firm are going to help them with their case or whether we're able to refer them to Elsa or David or yourself or one of our many other referral relationships, that's kind of where we start. So what we did strategically is we looked at the places in the country where we didn't have strong referral relationships and then reached out to our network to identify potential referrals in those areas and then initiated conversations. It's Zoomlandia, right? Zootopia. We have the opportunity to be anywhere. I can be on 12 planes a day, right? Whereas before you were limited to, I'm gonna be in New York this day, I'm gonna be in Miami that day. Now I can be anywhere, anywhere in the country, frankly, anywhere on the globe. So we've taken advantage of that opportunity to establish relationships with attorneys who either do what we do or attorneys who know people who do what we do so that when we get those inquiries for someone who does what we do in an area that we don't do it, we're still able to help the people that come to us because we know who those good people are, whether they're in North Carolina, Georgia, or Seattle. 
So we've taken a very strategic, let's take this opportunity to fill in the blanks um, and maximize the efficiencies that the pandemic is providing us and try to turn that uh, into an opportunity. And we've built some really good relationships over the last year. I think we all thought, um, I think as Rana mentioned, that we all thought this was gonna be short-lived and it certainly has not been. Um, but I think the benefit of that is that we've all learned to pivot and take advantage of the time and the opportunity that we have, especially now that we're perhaps going back to some form of normalcy. So for those of us listening and watching, uh, hear you talk about the fact that you're actually reaching out to people who you don't know to try to establish these relationships. What, is, what has the reaction been? I mean, number one, I'd be interested in knowing how do you what's kind of your process for reaching out? Because uh, some of us may see that as a little creepy, particularly during a pandemic when there's enough dysfunction and creepiness out there. Um, and then I'd be interested to hear how receptive are those new relationships when they do receive either your phone call or your email or your Zoom? I, I won't take that personally, Jonathan. <laughs> um, Hypothetically, of course, you know me. Hypothetically creepy, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the approach has always been a, a soft one, a warm uh, reach out, which essentially says something along the lines of, we receive inquiries for work where you are, right? We don't, we're not licensed there. We'd like to be able to potentially send these clients to you right? Can we sit down and do a Zoom coffee, right? And get to know a little bit about you and about your practice to see if, you know, what kind of cases you would want and what kind of clients you're looking for to make sure we can make a, make a fit. Um, it probably sounds to some like, you know, we're trying to sell them some sort of email marketing <laughs> program. Um, but I think once they see that we're a law firm that does this kind of work, um, they, the reception has been very good. Um, I was just on a call yesterday with the head of uh, the ACTEC group, which is the preeminent trust in the states uh, association, frankly, in the world, um, out of North Carolina, based on you know a somewhat lukewarm introduction that a friend in Atlanta had made. But it's you know we now have probably one of the best trust in the state litigators on our speed dial. If we need anything there for a client or for a referral, he's there. And, you know, you, I book it for a half an hour. I try to be really respectful of people's time and perhaps it's, you know, only 15 minutes, but you know, you just, you let people know what you're trying to do. And again, leading with the why and letting people know that you're just trying to help people and you might be able to help them help people. It, it seems to work. It's been pretty well received. As a business development coach, I'll often advise my clients, when you are reaching out to those new relationships, let them know that you've done a little bit of research about them. You see that you sim swim in the same ponds and that you think, you think, you're not guaranteeing anything, that there may be an opportunity to collaborate. Anyone that I want to do business with who's on the receiving end of that email and sees a potential opportunity to either collaborate with another professional or for new business, I would hope would jump on something like that very quickly. And again, the way you word things, um, people are gonna do their due diligence on you. You wanna make sure that as they are researching you, that you come up legit and, and it's clear that you're not just some marketing company trying to sell them something. But um, for those that respond, those are the types of professionals across the country you probably wanna be doing more business with. David, how about for, for you or members of your firm, how have you been successful at, at new relationships in the last year? New relations as well. My, um, as, a, as a defense attorney for tax related pur uh, purposes, uh, the primary place that I get most of my referrals are gonna be from CPAs and other tax attorneys that you might think are uh, competitors and, so, and there is some overlap. I generally open the door up to uh, honestly and genuinely giving them help, coaching them to make money in the overlap areas, because um, what happens is that they view me as a source, a resource, Professor Dave, and later on when a, an issue comes up that's too big or they don't like or they don't want to do, I'm hoping they're going to have 
my name in their mind and, and we'll send them over. And, and so um, that has been the case for me uh, uh, always where I'm opening up, I, I'm suggesting to CPAs and lawyers that do the work that I do or similar work that they should give me a call for 15 minutes and they can get some information that could help them avoid some uh, bad actor at the IRS or some you know thing that uh, was happening. Um, with a pandemic uh, happening, I've also um, opened up to doing a regular Zoom Q&A uh, group uh, that allows people to come in and, and, uh, and talk together about these issues sort of uh, as, a, as professionals. And I found that generated a lot of extra work too. And in, in fact, uh, um, uh, I got a uh, question that came from a criminal attorney that doesn't do tax work about the impact of tax on one of the, the resolutions of the criminal case, a plea bargain. And uh, as a result of it, um, a week later, I get a new client from that relationship that's a criminal matter, purely tax or potential you know, uh, problem that we're trying to resolve for them. So, uh, it, and, and that person's not even in LA. That, they're in, in San Francisco, which normally uh, is not a place that I would normally find, uh, you know, fertile ground for new, new sprouts. <laughs> yeah. Have any of you had success in terms of um, reaching out to new relationships altogether, using LinkedIn for that as opposed to email? Perhaps it's a little more, it's a little less offensive if you see it. That way it's a little less direct because it is social media. Any thoughts on utilizing LinkedIn for these new relationship opportunities? I, um, sometimes you'll see, like, you know, you can pay for premium and see who sees you. And so sometimes if somebody sees me, I'm just curious why they, like there, there's been maybe a couple of times in the past year where I just dropped them a note to introduce myself or to say hi to them. But, um, I also don't want to seem creepy, Jonathan, but like some of it too is just being strategic about, and, and also uh, like you'll see sometimes on LinkedIn, you have like 18 people that you all know and you look up who they are and it's like so intuitive, like how do you not know them? So that those are the two instances where I may make an exception to the social media rule. Like I don't like to blind blindly reach out in that way, but those are two play, times where I would do it personally. Anyone else want to weigh in on the using LinkedIn for these new relationships? I think it's a good resource for doing your research, kind of like Elsa highlighted, to find out how you may know someone, learn a little bit more about them, find out how you might be connected. But I, I don't think connecting through LinkedIn is is the best natural, genuine um, path to connecting. Yeah, it's interesting. There, there have actually been some studies most people don't see social media as work similar to their email inbox. Email inbox feels like work and you got to respond and why is someone bugging me or why are they emailing me? For whatever reason, psychologically, social media, including LinkedIn, feels less serious, less official. And as a result, people, particularly people that you don't have relationships with, seem to be more accessible and will respond to you better because they feel more in control. And I, for example, have a real estate transactional attorney in St. Louis who is a paid member of LinkedIn and he can see everyone that hits his profile. And he's actually blocked out a couple hours every Wednesday where he sends people that have viewed him on LinkedIn an in-mail, which is LinkedIn's email system in, inside the system. He'll send them a message and it says something along the lines of, hey, Elsa, really great to connect with you this week on LinkedIn. I see that we both swim in the real estate pond here in Missouri. Perhaps there's a way for us to collaborate or to work together. Do you want to jump on a 10-minute Zoom in the next couple of weeks and um, become better familiar with each other's practices? Twenty. He tells me that 25 to 30% of his new business every year comes as a result of that outreach. Now, we may not all be comfortable doing that. That may have that creep factor that we've talked about a little bit earlier today, but for some of you, it may very well work. For this real estate transactional attorney in St. Louis, 30% of his work comes as a result of that activity. I would say that works, um, but it's not the only tool in the toolbox. So 
if it doesn't feel right for you or you haven't had success and you don't really want to do it, that's fine. Just make sure you're using some other outlet for staying in contact with people. David, anything for you on the LinkedIn issue? Um, yeah, I'm not. That's one thing that uh, I haven't found uh, a lot of that I that I devote myself to. I, I um, but it's I think it has to do with my personality and that I I'm, I actually prefer a cold call over doing that, believe it or not. And for me, I'd rather call somebody up uh, that doesn't even know I'm coming, <laughs> uh, jump on them, I guess. But because you can adjust, you can't adjust these things when you send off uh, messages like you don't know the group group creep value uh, factor. But if you call somebody on the phone, you can hear or or even better, I guess Zoom, if you were able to do that. But but you can still you can kind of assess and adjust your presentation. You know to get out of it looks like it's creepy. You know to change your pitch, and so you can kind of maneuver to make it not creepy. I hope. But that's uh, from my perspective, of course. <laughs> I also hope we never get to the point where I look down at my iPhone and there's an incoming Zoom call from someone that I haven't scheduled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's true. That would that's really, true. really. I haven't. Scary. I haven't done one of those uh, Zoom uh, creepy, uh, you know, uh, calls yet. <laughs> if they're even I'm, possible. I'm curious if you're also advising the younger professionals in your organizations either to do similar activities in terms of new relationships to make sure that they're expanding their networks as well, either to benefit their specific career or to benefit the firm um, collectively. Is your advice the same that you're doing or do you tweak it a little bit differently for people that may not be as well-versed at reaching out or may not have kind of the skills that you've developed over the years for, to David's point, kind of cold calling? Anything different that you'd advise a younger professional, Scott? Yeah, I, I think for the younger professionals, they need to stay in the game, right? So, you know, don't lose the momentum that you built pre-COVID just because it's COVID. So focus on your existing relationships, but continue to leverage those existing relationships, the people who are your people, the people who have your back, right? The people that you're, are your go-tos and use them right to help you expand and make introductions right are there people who you've gotten closer with you know during covid who are the people that you send this work to right do you have any contacts that do this or are in this space that you could introduce me to um, i think it's easier for them especially in this new environment to rely on their old relationships and what that does is not only create those new relationships but it reinforces the existing relationships for them and makes them stronger so you're really killing two birds with one stone great elsa it looked like you wanted to weigh in yeah i was gonna say i mean you know i started my practice you know scott came from a bigger firm i, I really just needed to sign clients on my own. So kind of what I tell my associates is something that I did. And it actually kind of came full circle yesterday on one story, which is when I started, I would just read articles in Variety or Hollywood Reporter. And if I would read about somebody's announcement, like so-and-so just joined this management company or whatever the case may be, I would send them a bag of um, like a box of cookies and a congratulations note. And this one particular manager 15 years ago was like, oh, thank you so much for the note. Come on by my office. And he said to his assistant, I don't really know who she is, but I'll, I'll take a meeting with her. And we met. And it's funny because yesterday my client said, oh, I have this really big Oscar award winning manager. And he, your name came up and he said that you guys met 15 years ago. And I got, you know, I got on the phone with him and he's like, how do we know each other? And I said, well, I just read an article about you and sent you cookies. And he was like, what? But, you know, I tell my associates, you kind of never know how it's going to turn out. And we have this familiarity. And it was just because like, you know, he liked my chocolate chip cookies and we met and like, we just connected then, but we never really had reasons to cross path, but there was like a familiarity in place. And to my associates, like they should be, if they want to really pursue music clients or clients that are in the influencer space, it's such a, you know, my industry in particular is so ever changing that like, they just have to say like, Hey, I read about this movie or this short film or this crazy, you know, AI thing you're doing. I'd love to talk to you about it for 10 or 15 minutes. And they, they have to invoke their curiosity to create that new connection. And my associates that are going to be rainmakers, right? They already have that inclination. And it's hard to push someone to do that unless they're that way. But I certainly believe in it. It, it has worked for me and it works for younger people that are 
that don't have a Rolodex? Number one, you can always send me chocolate chip cookies. I will always receive that package, Elsa. Snookies, cookies, Num always, yeah. N number two, to Elsa's point, it doesn't sound all that sophisticated, but do we really care if it works, folks? I mean, obviously it worked in this instance. There may be other situations where someone just ignores her altogether, but whether it's a bottle More of- More often than not. <laughs> yeah. But the point is, yeah. you know, it, it, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to scour the awards and recognition lists within your industry to figure out who deserves the box of cookies. It could be a client or a referral source around a holiday time, and it doesn't have to be the, the December holidays. It could be um, as something as simple as a handwritten note just to let someone know that you're thinking about them or that um, they exist, essentially. Those little acts of kindness and being proactive about it go so far because most people don't experience them all that often. David, anything for you in terms of how you're yeah. advising younger professionals? Well, first of all, I tell them that they should assess their personality and they want to do activities that they enjoy um, that matches with that personality uh, for a number of reasons. Once, one thing, of course, life is short. If you build yourself a career that sucks, then life's going to suck and your career is <laughs> going to suck. But marketing this is really important. <laughs> the next thing is to keep an attitude of genuine helping, genuinely expressing love or heartfelt uh, help, helpness. And it doesn't matter what category it is, when you're out there um, generally helping people get that new contact, answer questions about your practice or referring them to somebody else, and it's genuine and you're in the context of, of, of something you enjoy, I don't think there's a lot more to mix. It just, things will happen. That's my, what I experience. And when you do the thing where the guy that doesn't like going to the, to the you know, uh, cocktail parties is in the cocktail, it's just not gonna work. It's just yeah. poor, it's a bad choice. People can generally sense if you're not genuine or if you're not authentic, if you're trying to force a situation because someone has told you that it works or it's on someone's checklist, People generally can perceive that. So to David's point, you know, finding whatever it is that works for you, I think is a really important takeaway. Find, you know, maybe it is that box of cookies to celebrate someone's win, an anniversary, a birthday, a big deal that they closed, some kind of an award that they won. Little acts of kindness like that work and they go a long way. And we probably all at some point feel like, oh, I should send David a congratulatory card and we never get around to doing it. But I'm telling you, particularly during COVID, I've had plenty of clients that have sent gift baskets or hot meals to clients or referral sources or people within their network that are sitting at home, you know, tired of the kids, tired of the spouse, trying to keep the dog from sitting in their lap and they just need a little bit of break and that delivery from the Elsa's or the, or the David's or the Scott's of the world means everything to them. And it's so memorable that they'll always remember it um, because it so infrequently happens. I'd like to change the conversation a little bit now. We just got done talking about establishing those new relationships. What about the relationships that you currently have? I'm totally confident that if I opened any of your Outlook contact folders, or I looked at any of your LinkedIn profiles, there are probably thousands of contacts there that have crossed your threshold at some point. Um, with the limited time and energy that you do have for marketing or business development or networking, how do you even decide of the thousands where are you are going to spend your time? Scott, would you mind weighing in on this topic first? How do you prioritize? Uh, I think that's the answer. I think you have to prioritize. And I think it goes back to what I was saying previously about really focusing on who your key people are, right? Who are the people that you send work to, right? Who are the people that you refer in? Who are the people that refer to you? And I think this pandemic gave us an opportunity really to be vulnerable and be human and take advantage of that opportunity and reach out to people just to check in, right? Because everybody was home or is home you know, with their kids and their cats and their dogs and their spouses and maybe their in-laws and who knows who else is stuffed in that, stuffed in that house. Uh, but reaching out and just making contact, 
and letting them know that you're just thinking about them as a human being from human to human, um, I think has been one of the more powerful uh, approaches that we've seen be successful during the, the course of, of the pandemic. And then you can talk about, you know, the business and all those kinds of things, but, you know, really it's that human connection, that social animal instinct that we all have that, you know, adds the value to you, to whoever you're reaching out to and your relationship and just reinforces it. So we've spent a lot of time just talking about our experiences um, with, frankly, whomever we speak with. Um, and we stay away most, for the most part, we, we don't even talk about business until maybe the end of a conversation, right? It's really, it's a, it's an intense, authentic human check-in. Yeah. So you bring up a couple of different issues. Number one, how much of these how much of these conversations should be personal versus business? That's something that we could talk about, would probably be good to know. The other thing that, that I'm curious about, Scott, is um, are these proactive calls that you're making to people in your network that you don't otherwise have pending matters with? And if so, what's, what's been their reaction? It's like, well, if, you don't, if I'm not working with you on something, why the heck are you calling me? Elsa, do you want to... Do you want to weigh in on either of those two, either the personal versus the business, because they are contacts that you already have? And then also, are you being proactive about it or just reactive based on clients that you have pending matters with? I tend to be more on the reactive side just because I personally am sometimes put off by just general calls. Like, I don't like to speak generally about anything. And that that's like my personal preference. But I also have dis been disciplined and you've taught me, right? Like, you're very good at things like this about understanding that, you know, a law student that wants an informational call or a potential client that's not a right fit for the firm, but having a longer conversation and establishing relationship, like those are times where I'll invest the time beyond sort of the transactional systematic, like, what are you doing for me? What am I doing for you? Um, but, and then I, I, but I try to expand, like, for example, there, especially in my business, there's email chains with like 30 people. And there may be someone peripheral that I'm not dealing with directly on it, but that I have a relationship with. And I maybe use that as a jumping off point mm -hmm. to sidebar email them and say, you know, checking in, I can't, you know, I haven't talked to you in so long. Let's talk. So I do it a little bit more like that. And then for me personally, I'm involved in um, like a, a committee, for example, and that that is sort of my hub of really reaching out and using people as part of my cause. Therefore, it's the UCLA Entertainment Symposium, and that's been a really good way of me to have a purpose um, that really suits something that I'm passionate about and care about, and sort of expand my network in that way. It it just helps me feel like a little bit more um, having an agenda or a reason to, and that that's just something that works for me and how I approach people. Yeah, and I think the takeaway, folks, with current relationships is. Sometimes you can proactively reach out and just check in genuinely to see how the person is doing. And I don't think that's met with any kind of criticism or creep factor. You can't do that every month because at some point someone's going to be like, well, we're still on lockdown. Nothing's changed since you called me last month. So you have to mix it up a little bit. I had a situation recently where um, someone inside a firm that I've got an existing relationship just sent me an email. The email subject line said, checking in. And she said, hey, Jonathan, I just wanted to let you know that um, I was thinking about you the other day. And I realized that it's been a really long time since we just updated each other and, and kind of caught up. Would you be interested in jumping on a 10 minute Zoom call next week? Um, I was thrilled to get that email. Of course, there's nothing pending there, but this is someone that's in my network. I like them generally. I don't know them super well to where I've had them over for dinner at my home, but it was just nice to know that someone else is thinking about me when they don't really have to. David, how about for you in terms of staying in touch with people that are already in your network? What's been effective during COVID? Um, well, for me, um... I, you, the, I'm inspired by the statement you had about the, also the um, uh, percentage of time you talk about personal things. For me, every interaction I have with anybody is a potential uh, opportunity to connect with them. I, I, and it's partly just my personality, but it's my theory of business in a sense too. So, but 
the, what I do is I prep myself for a call, a call with some uh, positive attitude or whatever about the person, about the thing that I'm doing. But the key is to, is to be aware and emotionally listen to what's going on. You can detect if they are going to participate in a contact like that very easily. They're going to tell you. They're going to participate or they're not. So you just got to be conscious of that. And then I think you you spend, I always spend time chatting about whatever we can before we begin work. So long as the, you know, the person's not, oh, I got to go, I got to get this done. Would you please answer my question? Of course, you know what I mean? But for me, every every opportunity, every call I do, in particular with my practice and when I'm disputing things with the IRS, for instance, it is excre it's, it's um, part of the game is me trying to turn the, the, the table from me facing the other guy on the other side with the IRS to us both on the same side of the table looking at the problem, if that makes any sense. And how do you do that? Well, part the first place, if they're a former employee, well, I'm, a, I'm a former employee and we have a connection at the government, is to talk about that, talk about their retirement, and then Talk about why well, when if I was at the IRS and I had a guy like this, my client, well, I remember what I would do. And it starts, I start going to the same side of the table for a while. That same thing with uh, when I'm out on uh, talking to somebody, a, a, a new potential referral or an old client, if they're open for it, it's an opportunity. And and but be but be sensitive, super sensitive to what's going on in that call, so that you can adjust. <laughs> to that situation so you're not pushing somebody and being creepy uh, and so forth. So, Yeah, I think everyone has been impacted differently as a result of COVID. Some of us, it's been less impactful on or perhaps our resiliency is just better. And so we never exactly know what the other person on the end of the Zoom or the end of the phone call or the end of the email, what the impact has been if we haven't had a conversation. I think if there's ever a time to demonstrate some empathy, it's now. And I think we also allow the person on the other end that we're contacting to really decide when it goes from personal to professional. I've got plenty of clients who have worked for, for their clients for a number of years. And my clients have reported back to me because of Zoom, this is the first time I've ever seen the person's face. I've done tons of deals with them before. Prior to COVID, it never made sense for us to get together generally because of distance. But now that I can jump on a Zoom call, I can see the person. I can see their facial expressions. I can see part of their life around them. And that all helps with the common connectiveness and the common experience that we're sharing. When you are proactively reaching out, folks, do you find that people prefer a phone call or can you convert them into a Zoom? so that you get the added benefit of the facial expressions and the yawns and the head nods and the gotchas and all that kind of stuff. Scott, what, what, how do you go about asking people what they're, you know, to kind of choose their own adventure? Uh, I, I invite people to a Zoom, uh, but occasionally, and it's the exception, people will say, I'm just Zoom exhausted and can we just please do a phone call? I don't, you know, I don't want to put my pants on, right? Like, can we please just do it on a, on a telephone call the old fashioned way? But I can probably count on one hand the number of times that that's happened over the last year where someone has, you know, cried uncle and said, I, I don't want to Zoom with you. Um, and it's usually with somebody that, you know, feels comfortable because we have a relationship saying that. Um, but it's, it's really the exception. The vast majority of people are looking to, as David said, you know, find a way to connect. And it's much easier to connect in person, obviously, but this is as close as we can get in a lot of situations right now. So I think most people are up for it. And, and frankly, looking for a connection with someone other than the people that are with them in their four walls. You're expecting us to believe, Scott, that people actually turn you down for a Zoom call? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> How is that possible? Like Elsa, that. how about for you? Um, has has being able to convert these interactions to some kind of a video or Zoom inter interaction been effective? Uh, it's interesting because for 
for what I do, so much is Zoom now. I'm sure you guys are experiencing this also, but like even pitches and um, like kickoff meetings with networks and my clients want to talk on Zoom, which is like super funny because they it was all phone, but now they want to like look at me and see my facial expressions. And what's interesting is like now my eye rolls are indicative, right? Like I can't get it. And my, my client this morning said she rolled her eyes. She doesn't like it. So uh, I, the jig is up a little bit. Um, and so in that, in that sense, um, I don't necessarily push the zoom calls, but one thing that has been effective that I've been on the receiving invitation of, and, and I've done is like, um, kind of a coordinated, uh, like happy hour where like, I just had a network invite six of my attorneys. They're sending us a little like happy hour kit and we're all getting on zoom and everyone's excited about that. And I felt like that was like a really great gesture on behalf of the network. And we've done the reverse in a couple instances where, you know, there's a, there's a group of us that really focus on a specific area of business and we want to get to know one or two people. And we, we make it more of an event. Um, it's sort of like an online networking event in a way. So those have been really effective because people appreciate the kit, like the thoughtfulness around it. And it's something for everyone to look forward to. And it's not just one-on-one because sometimes people like the relief of having multiple heads to, to talk to. Yeah, good. David, how about for you? Yeah, definitely. I recently, um, because of the COVID and the Zoom, I have had uh, lots of referral sources that I've never, ever met. CPAs and lawyers. And recently, even last week, one of my, I haven't seen uh, forever, an older fellow CPA, I suggested it, he gets on and we're laughing because we, you don't know what, he kind of knew what I looked like from the internet. I had no idea what he looked like. And you do, it. I think it definitely um, helps the communications. As you know, we're, we're humans and nonverbal communications uh, mean a lot to us. And I think it, it helped, uh, it was fun, and I assume because it was fun for both of us, it it would it help you know bring a connection together. So I I like it, and I prefer it if I can have if people will participate with it. And I've not yet seen too many people frown upon it, but a lot of times when I'm doing the work I'm doing, uh, uh, it just doesn't incline towards it. We're just always in the momentum of doing the phone call uh, and looking at something, so it doesn't it just doesn't get it seems weird to say, hey, how about Zooming? It almost sounds like, hey, how about let's go drive uh, go-karts <laughs> or something <laughs> like that. It's, um, yeah, let's get this jo- job done later and then I'll, uh, I'll go drive a go-kart with you. And what's, what's ironic about relationship building is you would think that relationships um, would be less strong when you can't get in front of someone but I've had tons of clients report back to me that as a result of doing things over Zoom, they've never felt more connected with clients. They've they felt like this has actually created a situation where the relationships are stronger, they're deeper, not only because you have that, that um, visual element that perhaps we've never had before or never taken advantage of, but also because we're all sharing the shared COVID experience. We get to know how people are getting along with their spouse and their kids and educating from home. And we're sharing in those common challenges. And I think that by nature builds and furthers and deepens a relationship. Um, Switching topics uh, again for a minute. I'm interested in um, how technology has either helped or, or hurt um, your outreach and are there specific technologies perhaps other than Zoom that you have found helpful in making all of this work during the pandemic? Elsa, can we start with you? Yeah, I mean, in terms of reach out, um, I think uh, I'm in that team Zoom paradox, right? Like all the things that we are in, I think there's like one other one, WebEx or something that certain networks use that I, it still scares me um, to be on. <laughs> Um, and other than that, I just do whatever my IT guy says. I I think part of it too is like accessibility, like figuring out how, uh, to be accessible to people beyond email. And, and I, one of the things from a network and outreach standpoint, and also just responsiveness that I, I feel like is helpful is like the phones. It's something silly, but before pandemic, we never really thought about it, but having the ability to know when people call you and how, and not having this idea of like a, a message or an outreach getting stuck in the receptionist side of things or the office, like that's been something we've really had to refine since the pandemic started because 
that cold call that I get, right? Like it can't sit in the ether for two or three days just because I'm not physically in front of my office or my assistant taking the messages. So that's something that we've we've refined because that two or three or four day lag sometimes is the difference between us engaging with a client. And that's, you know, I get I guess with the cloud phone, you can do it on your actual cell phone and just forward call. So things like that and have helped us be a little bit better about how we're getting information, how we're giving information and what's accessible to us. Scott, on the technology side, anything that has been uh, particularly helpful that you're doing now that perhaps you hadn't been doing prior to this time last year? It's certainly using video conferencing is by far and away the biggest change, um, whether it's Microsoft Teams or Zoom. And I too hate it when it's something that I'm not familiar with and it looks like the entire thing's upside down. We had a trial in Los Angeles Superior Court last month where the LA Superior Court's non-Zoom Zoom program did not work. It wasted an entire day. And at the end of the day, we told the judge, how about we send a Zoom link to everyone here tomorrow and we'll do the trial on Zoom instead. And the judge said, mm-hmm, it just works, right? And it's, it, it's an easy platform. It's intuitive. Um, even I can use it. Um, so that, that has been the biggest game changer. It's given us access to our team, it's given us access to existing referral sources and relationships, and it's allowed us to expand those relationships significantly, again, without getting on a plane, which pre-COVID was my happy place, right? Crawling onto the plane, no kids, no noise, the Wi-Fi never works the way it's supposed to, so you can kind of check out a little bit and just get done what you actually want to get done. You know, that's all gone now, but, you know, the benefit is- It's coming know, back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at least you can be in contact with LA Superior Court, Scott. Right. This is this is the important thing. David, how about for you in terms of the use of technology or different technologies? Yeah, th there is one thing that's going to sound like a plug, but I. Um, <laughs> so what I do is uh, I have to deal with very sensitive information, information with a client that is um, that can get them in trouble that the IRS might send a summons or a subpoena out rather up stuff. I'm begging all my clients and everybody that I deal with, do not email, do not email, do not email. Discovery. Why? It's a log. It's a log too. And you can't even get, how do you delete an email? They're on every phone and, and on some computer somewhere. So what we've been doing, I'm pushing my clients to is Signal. Now, Signal sounds like something for a drug dealer or something, I think, some people think, but here's why I like it. It's, it's an supposed app. to be in, it's an app. It's, it's, an app. it's like a, a substitute for maybe like text or WhatsApp or things like that. Uh, yeah. The reason why I like it is that it you can set the thing, it's encrypted, but you can set the text to delete automatically within a day, 12 hours, a week. I tend to push my clients there, set it so that the communication deletes within a week or less. And then I invite them now to text me. Everybody cannot is, is avoiding these calls it make it slows things down but the best way in the past for me was to say don't tell me where the smoky gun is on the grassy knoll call me and talk to me about it now i can talk a little bit more freely because it's disappearing it mimics a little bit more like what humans do where we talk and it's gone it's, it's not like snapchats there. for grown-ups Something yeah. like that. And okay. what's amazing about it too is that you can also send docs. You can also send huh. other th things through it and those things will disappear. I am told by my, you know, I'm not a techie guy. I've been told by them, this is secure. Of course, I put the note to it is this is a changing thing. It's almost like the, I guess the, the race with the technology with them, you know, cons you know uh, countries and, and uh, espionage, I'm sure one day it won't be, and you'll have to move to something else. For now though, it's wonderful. And what happened, what's been happening is my clients now have accessed me, me in a way they hadn't and the referral sources do, because they can pop up and say stuff to me and get my attention, although it doesn't have to be attention getting like a phone call. You know what, what I mean? Wait, what is it called again? Sorry, I'm not. It's called down. Signal. It's like Signal. WhatsApp. Oh. It's like okay, WhatsApp, it. except for okay. it's, it, it has that added feature. Mm -hmm. um, I like it. I'm pushing everybody there. And like for instance, um, I have a, a case right now that I'm dealing with a CPA. Uh, we're working with the client. I have to insulate the situation, so I'm the go-between to communicate to protect the client to get a, an amended return in. 
now I can do this where it would take like a, a letter, a phone call back and forth. It ha something that would take maybe three hours is, is happening really quick and it's hmm. protected. And I'm still the, the, the gatekeeper. So and I, it I like goes it. away. And then it disappears. And, and that's what <laughs> lawyers love, especially Supposedly. guys like me. Supposedly it goes away. Yeah. Well, I know that's what I'm scared about, of course, but they've told me, but I know. Yeah, yeah, I'm sad yeah, Scott it. and I would accidentally tweet it. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> that's the problem. Well, remember, it is on your, it, whatever device it's on, it, it, it'll it be on that device for as long as it's there and then it'll delete. You got to, you know, and if somebody takes a picture of the screen, it's not like you can't stop people from recording stuff. It's still yeah. what it is. Try to avoid e electronic uh, information when you have something that matters, that's scary, that's it's secure, but you know, that's, I feel, you know, we all feel uh, this is one of the problems of being in this new world. Somehow yeah. I think Snowden still has access to it, but that's Probably. a, <laughs> a, me. That's a different MPTF presentation <laughs> for yeah. the future. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> Jonathan, one other technology thing, sorry, it, that actually has made a big difference is um, like we didn't really use Slack before the pandemic. And so what we do have um, dedicated channels that our, our internal staff can subscribe to. So for areas of interest, and that's kind of how we kind of internally cross-reference or cross-refer share information that is causing us to do more outreach. So like there's a channel about, um, you know, unscripted television stuff. And we'll say, oh, hey, take a look at this article about this particular thing, or I'm on the phone with this agent. He said it's this, that. So the sharing of the information. So in real time, we're all kind of keeping each other in the loop on things also kind of helps prompt that business development side as well. Good. I like it. The last um, topic that I'd like to cover before our time is over is I'm interested in hearing what activities you're doing differently now as a result of the pandemic to be more resourceful to your networks, to be more resourceful for, to the people that you serve and that you get referrals from? Are there forums that you've created? David hinted on it a little bit earlier in, in the Zoom today about kind of this Q&A forum that he sets up once a month. He can invite people that he meets along the way to be a part of it. He doesn't charge anyone for it. He answers questions. It's kind of a nice opportunity to have specific things answered as, as long as they probably don't take an hour to do. Are there other things that you're doing to add that value or to, to demonstrate the value that your organizations can provide? I'll say one thing that I have become um, like an expert in is I, I, when the pandemic started, I really felt out of touch with people and I, I made a promise to myself to express gratitude. And so I am, I consider myself to have like an MBA in gift giving. And it's not about a, amount of money, it's about specificity and thoughtfulness of it. So, you know, I have my go-to baby shop that know me by name where I get like the best baby gifts or I have referral gifts that are very customized to people. Like I know that they're a whiskey guy or I know that they love chocolate and I'll send them C's candy. And I have a, um, a basket company that I've worked with for a decade and they do custom baskets. So for me, it's about writing that note and customizing and showing my gratitude for people that sometimes in the busyness pre-pandemic, you don't really have time to express that. Um, that that's been a huge way for me to remain in contact and, and show my appreciation for you. Cause the part of the network is not just like what you can do for me, but it's like the, the, you're grateful that people surrounding you from mentors to interns, everyone have supported you in your career. And so that's been a huge thing that I've been really methodical about and it has paid off. And I've even had like opposing counsel who've been terrible to me for a decade. This one particular guy, he's now so nice to me just because I got his daughters these cute dresses. And like, it, it was like a pair, like I wish I would have gotten it five years ago, but um, things like that, I think that I, I've invested the time and have really paid off and, and it's genuine. Like I want people to know that I appreciate them being in my network, even though I can't see them. Yeah, Scott, I know that on some of the group Zoom calls that you're on where there's 30, 40, 50 people, sometimes you just feel like it's such a waste of time how do you make that time more efficient? And I know you, there's something specific that you do that I think would be worthy of sharing with the group. Yeah, yeah, uh, and thank you for pointing that out. Uh, so anytime I'm on a group Zoom, uh, I maximize use of the chat feature. It's an opportunity to connect with people, 
catch up with them. Within Zoom, the chat feature. Correct. correct. Directly messaging people. Directly messaging people through the chat feature. But I also have been involved in any number of conversations over text during meetings or emails because people will see you and they want to connect with you. And some people, it's not signal, so they don't feel safe. They're not sure who's checking the chat box um, and they don't want to be seen as you know playing hooky in the middle of class. So they'll text you offline or email you offline. Um, I think it's harder to do it that way because you're moving from device to device, but you know, it's an opportunity, right? You see somebody you know, somebody you like, or frankly, even people I don't know, right? If I see somebody, for example, uh, David mentioned his referral sources come from, from CPAs and other tax lawyers. For me, it's trust in the state lawyers because we don't do the planning, we don't do the taxes, we only do the disputed cases. So they're a great referral source for us and for us to refer to them. So if I see someone in that space, I'll start a conversation and then offer to reach out later, but it's a great opportunity. You're there, you're in the room. You would probably do the same thing if you were at a cocktail party. So why not take advantage of it on the virtual platform? Thank you, David, anything, a final uh, thought on something you're doing differently now than before? Well, the only thing that inspired by the, the conversation was that when we're doing Zoom and we have a bigger group, we definitely push for uh, the breakout groups of around three to five and try to do them often because there is, um, there's so many different personalities out there. Uh, some people are able to pronounce themselves into a group. If you stay on um, Zoom in that level, only those people that can be big enough for the group will be heard and seen. So we got to give those little sidebars or those pre, when you walk in in the room and you group together with a few people, uh, make those opportunities. That's the only thing I would encourage for people that haven't thought of that when you get to bigger groups. Great. David, Scott, Elsa, thank you for your comments today on how to always stay in fighting condition. Sharam, I'm turning it back to you. Thank you, Jonathan. And thank you, Elsa and Scott and David for a great discussion. And thank you for joining us for the MPTF PAN webinar 2021 strategies for furthering and fostering relationships virtually. We hope this presentation helped you on a uh, helped you professionally to reach out to clients or potential clients. Kathy will keep you updated on our next presentation in May. Uh, we are still confirming the date, but um, it's going to be a great topic. So we'll see you all soon. Thank you for joining in.